It is. Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal, and I'm here tonight with Bruce McCurdy. Hey, Bruce. Hey, David. How are you doing tonight? Fantastic. It was a historic night in Canadian soccer slash football history. A absolutely um, thrilling uh, shootout victory in a 1-1 game of Canada over Venezuela. Canada goes to the semifinal of the Copa Americana against Venezuela. Bruce, that game put the erratic in frenetic. Um, and I know there's no erratic and frenetic, but that's the point. It was an insane game where Canada and both Venezuela had all kinds of chances to score and they couldn't score. So, yeah, it was madness itself. So we'll see what happens. So who do they matched up with in the semis or do they not know yet? Lionel Messi's Argentina. Oh, back with Argentina, eh? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then win or lose, they're, I mean, they're in the medal round now, so they'll have a crack at a, a bronze at minimum at the end. Do they have that? Uh, yeah, sure. Okay. You know, you have two semifinals, and so you're going to have two losing semifinalists, so generally they will play one another for the bronze. I can't imagine it would be any different from any other tournament. Yep. It's not like a page playoff format or something, right? That's, yeah. This is, so. so that capped off a big night, um, which had started off pretty good with the trade of Ryan McLeod in a trade that was generally celebrated by Oilers fans, even Oilers fans that, you know, one quarter of Oilers fans, I'm going to say, who thinks Ryan McLeod is the bee's knees of a hockey player. Like, mm-hmm. there's, he has a lot of fans. And, and you and I are also I'm fans. I'm one of them. But, I, I mean, some people even like him more than we do. And I think we have a lot of time for Ryan McLeod, but, but I didn't see anyone really complaining about the trade. Um, and we'll, we'll get into that. But we're going to start off Bruce, where we left off. And we left off on free agency day. We thought it was all wrapped up in the afternoon. <laughs> As did many uh, commentators, and they graded the Oilers. They graded the, uh, the winners and losers of free agency before uh, Jeff Jackson did his best work, which was mm-hmm. signing Jeff Skinner, Matthias Janmark, and Adam Henrique. So let's start off. I think that was a full day. Yeah. For Jeff Jackson and uh, Father, I know it was for you and me with five posts each, and Kurt wrote three that day. I'm pretty sure we set an all time record at the Cult of Hockey. And I think the order set a record for most transactions in one day. I counted 14, David. It one, was bu- one buyout of Jack Campbell. Yeah. Uh, and the signing of, uh, of, uh, uh, of 13 players it was one a, at a time it was a wild day and by the end of it Oilers fans were elated bruce they mm-hmm. were absolutely elated interestingly you know listening to the podcast and such from around the league afterwards i i think a lot of um commentators kind of missed the point the true brilliance of jackson on that day and it's because there wasn't any super big name signings like the biggest name is Victor Arvidsson. You know, he's probably the best player that he signed that day. So there wasn't any, like, names, like, you know, the biggest names, Jake Gensel or Steven Stamkos or Jonathan Marsh or so. There wasn't any of that, and that's what got a lot of the attention. But the brilliance... No, no Nikita of, Zadorov. No David. Nikita Zadorov, Elias Lindholm. But the brilliance <laughs> of what he did, Bruce, was he signed it boatload of really good players at huge bargain prices, discount prices. And I didn't hear that mentioned hardly at all, even from astute hockey observers. You know, it was kind of like, well, he got the Henrique and he got, and he, you know, he convinced this player to come back and that, you know, th- there was some mention that, he, you know, the, the players decided to, to stick with the Oilers. But I think, Bruce, I don't know what the average is, but we're going to get it. We're going to get into a little bit of this, but players took, you know, in terms of the raises they could have got in other cities. Well, mm-hmm. I worked it out for Jan Mark and um, Connor yeah. Brown. They Jan Mark signed for three years at one point one four five million, and um, Brown at one year at one point one million. One million and, flat. Yeah, and there was all kinds of players, Bruce, in that same category. Um, let's let fourth liners who played less than no, eleven minutes. List. 
Yes, well even done. strength. So Sam Lafferty, Blake Lazat, Brandon Duhame, Garnet Hathaway, mm -hmm. Kevin Stenlin, and Ryan Lomberg. These all tend to be a little bit more physical or a lot more physical players, but not uh, but similar even strength scoring, generally speaking, Lafferty a bit higher. Um, similar, um, wait, th these players had hits, but um, Brown and Janmark were better, way better penalty killers than all any of them. Some of them aren't penalty killers at all. So I thought they were all in kind of the same categories, which would be really, really good, useful fourth line players last regular season, and uh, and including the playoffs. And um, those guys, on average, signed for two years, two million dollars each season per two million per. That was the going rate for this kind of player, and that's sixty-five. You know, if that would, that, you know, based on the average of what they signed for Yanmark and Brown, that would have been a sixty-five percent raise if they had taken that money for them, based on what they're going to get with the Oilers. And with with um, Adam Henrique Bruce, it's even more extreme. Here's some of this. So Adam Henrique, um, at his points per sixty, which is one way to rate a uh, forward. I think we can all agree Adam Henrique's a pretty good defensive center. Like he's not below average, at least. He's above average defensive center. So I'm going to compare him to Sean Monaghan, um, Elias Lindholm, um, Alexander Wenberg, <laughs> and ch my writing's so bad I can hardly read this, Chandler Stevenson. So these were these are other players. They're in the ballpark. That's, that's reasonable, Seth. Okay, so Henrique had 1.87 points per 60. Monaghan had 1.84. Uh, Chandler Stevenson, 1.66. Elias Lindholm, 1.39 points per 60 this year. And uh, Wenberg, 1.27. Mm -hmm. 1.27 and 1.39 is starting to get in fourth line territory, like honestly. So um, anyway, I don't think any of those players, now those players tend to be younger players than Henrique. So maybe yes. have more upside, they might still have more, you know, might be better bets to have good years. But Adam Henrique is arguably as good as any of those players. He signed for two years at $3 million. Monaghan signed for five years at $5.5 million. Chandler Stevenson, seven years at 6.25. Elias Lindholm, seven years at 7.75. And Wenberg, two years at $5 million. Now, again, like the term is longer on some of these players because they're a lot younger than Adam Henrique. So yes. that makes sense. But mm -hmm. the, the dollar amounts <laughs> that they're getting compared to like next year, mm -hmm. would you rather have Adam Henrique at 3 million than any of those other players at what they're getting? I mean, it's just crazy so, what some of them are getting. Well, some of, I mean, Henrique got 6 million for two years. The term's perfect for me. I love two year contracts for older players. You don't need to be going with this five, six, seven year stuff. No, um, and the Oilers got enough, more than enough of those already. So, in to some extent, um, uh, the die was cast in terms of how the Oilers had to do business. <clears throat> they just weren't in the market to go out and sign some thirty or forty million dollar contract. And in fact, they didn't spend that much on all these contracts combined. Uh, You're right. You're right. I think it was. Uh, I counted eight NHLers, and you know you. Depends on where you want to draw the line. I included Josh Brown and, and Troy Stetcher, uh, but I didn't include some of the, you know, guys that frankly haven't established themselves yet. Uh, but most of them were like super cheap, and I think it was 17 million for next year and 28 million altogether that they committed for these eight players, and it was uh, whereas some of the guys you just named. Teams committed more than that amount for one single player. Well, here, okay, Sean Monahan, he's earning more, 5.5 million, than the entire third line of the Edmonton Oilers in, from Game Seven next year. They're yeah. earning 5.54 million next next year as a group, and he's earning 5.5 million. One guy who's yeah. who is he's a good player, like he's, but is he better uh -huh. than Adam Henrique? No, he's not. He, you know, boring they're competitive. Sean boring Sean Monahan, and yet we get Yanmark and Brown. Listen, Bruce, yeah. I remember the last podcast, I was a little down because I was hoping like they'd get two out of three of these guys to come right. back. That was, all. and they got them all. Wow. And they got them all at major Affordable discounts. Prices. Yeah. Now, again, I don't know what the mark, like, I don't know actually what Brown, Yanmark, and Henry, if they had tried to get top dollar, could have got. More I, than I they got. 
more than they got. Yeah, Way more. For sure. Like Alexander Wenberg at his 1.27 points per 60. Like he got bought out before at $5 million, and now someone else is paying him $5 million. What's up with that? San Jose, I think it is. Like, anyway, uh, good on the Oilers for staying away from those, and good on them for, you know, convincing these guys to take, you know, one- or two-year deals. And like I say, you know, right now they're working on mortar between the bricks. They got the bricks, and they got the big brick contracts. You know, the four plus years for five plus million dollars. None of that. They just, you know, fleshed out. And Jeff Jackson, I mean, I'll give him credit. He said, when interviewed at the draft, he said, you know, we like the guys we got. We want to sign as many of them as we can. Well, guess what? They did. They signed, what, six of their own uh, free agents, counting uh, Cal Pickard that they signed a couple days before. And then they went out and got uh, uh, Troy Stetcher, the one defenseman, but that entire third line, and then uh, Corey Perry that they brought back. And that doesn't include the outsiders that they brought in, specifically Arvidsson and Skinner. So, uh, yeah, they lost Warren Fogle, of course. Lost Fogle, lost and he signed a, I think L.A. got a pretty good contract for Warren Fogle okay. considering the prices that were being thrown around there. Like, he's mm-hmm. not a bad hockey player. He... He will work hard, and he's got some skill, and he can kill penalties. He was part of that at great Oilers kill, and uh, you know he's 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 like McLeod. The two players, if you look at our the numbers that we keep, Bruce, kind of their plus minus on grade A shots at even strength. The two players who had the biggest drop between the regular season and the playoffs were Warren Fogle and Ryan McLeod, and I don't think it's any coincidence that it's those two players who are being moved out. And I think with different playoffs, it would have, might have been might well have been a different story for for right. either of them. I just think that rightly or wrongly, the playoffs coaches and GMs make up their minds about players. Can you help me win a Stanley Cup? When the chips are down, are you there to win the Stanley Cup? Will you do what it takes? Can you do what it takes? And sometimes these assessments are wrong. Like I think Jordan Everly, there was a bad assessment in this regard, and he went on to have some good playoff years right. in other cities. But sometimes they're right. Sometimes they are correct, and you and you just do need a different mix. So I I like both Warren Fogle a lot, and um, Ryan McLeod quite a bit. But um, I think it was the playoff performance that was the final straw with both of them. Yeah, and another guy that's maybe on the a little bit in the crosshairs that had a relatively well pretty poor statistical playoffs. Uh, Derek Ryan, 19 yeah. games, one assist, minus nine. And I think he is, um, he's the long shot of the returning players to stay on the team. I think there's, you know, he might, you know, be an extra forward or he could very possibly lose out. I guess the departure of Ryan McLeod improves his chances some, but some of the, some of the players that struggled in the playoffs, They've either moved on from them. I mean, uh, uh, the minus leaders for the Oilers, and again, this is the quick and dirty stat. We can dig into five on five. Derek Ryan minus nine, Vincent DeHarney minus nine, gone. Darnell Nurse minus nine, and they got to figure out what they're doing there. Ryan McLeod, Warren Fogle each minus seven, gone, gone. And Evander Kane minus seven. They got to figure out what they're doing there. But I mean, those were sort of the the players that were losing their parts of the games in the playoffs and three of them are flat out gone. And a couple of the others are, I would say skating on thin ice. So I have the lines right now, RNH McDavid and Hyman, um, Skinner, Dreisaitl and Arvidsson, Janmark, Henrik and Brown, uh, same third line. And then a fourth line of Vander Kane, Dylan Holloway and Corey Perry with Matthew Savoy biting at Corey Perry's heels. I don't, I, or Derek Ryan. Um, I don't think, I think Savoy will be in the minors probably. Right. Um, so Skinner was signed for 3 million. Apparently he could have gone to, they, Toronto was, was trying to convince him to come there. Mm-hmm. He, I, I honestly have very little impression of the player. I've probably seen him play many times over the years because every time they play Buffalo or whoever he's, Carolina, I've seen him play, but I don't mm-hmm. remember him very much. He's not like Arvidsson who sticks out in my memory. Mm-hmm. Um, 
probably from playoff series. But right. so he is a well, he's known as a throw, remember Jeff Skinner from any playoff series because he's never played never a single been playoff one. game. So he's, he's in the category scorer. of one. Yeah. He's played a thousand NHL games. He's made a hundred million dollars in the NHL, and he's never played oh a single God. playoff game. How's that for a combination? Uh, I think uh, chances are very good he'll be playing a playoff game or two uh, uh, a few months from now, and pretty sure that's what was sticking in his craw. He doesn't need any more money. He wants to get in a situation where <clears throat> he's playing with good players that are going to win something, and. Uh, uh, he wound up in a pretty good spot. You know, he's got 357 goals in his career. He's 32 years old. Uh, I think he ranks 13th uh, among active players in goals, 357 goals. He's had 10 seasons of 20-plus goals, six seasons of 30-plus goals. And, you know, he's been a consistent producer. He just he had one little crash right after he signed his big contract in Buffalo. Yeah. He was in the tank for basically two years. I think there was injuries in there, and there was just, you know, stuff not going well in Buffalo. He did rebound, Pictures though. at 11. And last then he rebounded. Years. We had a great year last year. Him and Tage Thompson really broke out on the same line. And... Uh, unlike you, I have a very strong impression of this player, David, and uh, uh, I love to watch Jeff Skinner. I'm delighted that he's going to be here for at least one, probably just oh, really? That's good. his career. And the reason is because uh, of his skating, uh, he is he stands out as being the very rare NHL NHLer who was an exceptional figure skater as a young fellow, and he went to, I'm not sure, maybe age 14, age group, he went to Junior Nationals Canada and finished third. So, I mean, he was, like, way up there. Mm -hmm. And he does, you know, you can see the skills, and he's not, like, he's not even a burner, but what he is is highly elusive with the spins and the step sequences. You know, those are straight out of figure skating. You won't see too many triple or even single axles out of him, but you'll see a lot of sort of the fundamental skating skills. And he's a dervish out there. Uh, he's going to be a whole lot of fun to watch on a regular basis. I've had him in my pool for a few years, so I uh, hadn't had an eye on him for a while. And I'm, you know, my wife and I are both figure skating fans for decades. And so it's kind of fun to see those skills being applied in the National Hockey League setting and working. I mean, that's, like I say, he's, he's scored a lot of goals in this league, and a lot of it is through his uh, his elusiveness and ability to uh, to uh, navigate tight spaces with, uh, with um, innovative uh, uh, movement. So I'm, I'm kind of... Excited to see how he's going to look as an oiler and watching him play, hopefully, for 82 games plus. Well, I hope he's... I'm a little worried about um, the Oilers. They lost to Harney, who's a big yep. physical player. Darnell Nurse has not been a big physical player. It strikes me in a Since while. Tore his hip flexor. Yeah. So the biggest physical player was Evander Kane. And sure. Evander Kane has come in for a lot of heat. Frankly, Bruce, I don't get it. I think, mm -hmm. um, he, according to our numbers, he was strong, even strength in the playoffs. He wasn't great on defense, never is. He's a mediocre at best defensive player who sometimes loses his check and loses um, in, the, in the D zone and wanders a bit. But he was great on the attack. He chipped on a lot of great A shots. And, um, you know, lots of people were complaining about his, about the order's lack of physical play against Florida in the end. I heard that a lot. Like, or, or Florida had a physical fourth line and we didn't. If you're complaining about the order's lack of physical play and then you also want a Vander Kane bought out or traded away, like, what, what are you thinking? He was by far, by far the most physical player on the Edmonton Oilers in the playoffs and the most effective physical player. He pounded Quinn Hughes almost out of that series. He stood up to Nikita Zadorov, and I still hold without Kane in that series. I don't I don't think the Oilers win because Nikita mm -hmm. Zadorov was single-handedly running the Oilers' show. Quinn Hughes is an Trying extremely to. dangerous player, 
and you need you you had a player like him. He has a unique skill set of skill and ferocity, and I, people are really mad at him because he had a weak final. Wow. I, I don't know about the that narrative, Bruce. I wonder about it because I saw a guy who 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 was killing himself to play. Couldn't even sit on the bench. He was so yeah. injured. Apparently taking a lot of shots, you know, like needles to take to play. And people were were saying, oh, he's, he he didn't perform in the finals. Like, where's the where's the the respect for a you know a guy who gives it his all until he just has absolutely zero left to give and really gave a lot and really helped your team win the playoffs? I, I'm a little bit appalled, honestly, about some of the reactions I see about Evander Kane right now. That's that's my take. He's a very polarizing figure, and he always has been, and he has been in a variety of NHL cities, from Atlanta uh, to Winnipeg to Buffalo to San Jose, and now after a couple of years here in Edmonton, like he's got a, he's like some of those coaches, you know, have a shelf life, and at a certain Cordarella. point he starts Keenan. to grind on the nerves. Uh, he did himself no favors. I'll say this when. Uh, uh, when he announced at the beginning of the playoffs that he'd been battling a core body injury all year, and that whether it was his deliberate intent, anyway, the byproduct was that Ken Holland took a whole lot of shit for uh, not LTIRing the guy, and you know, there's a lot that has to go into that, including the agreement from the player. We talked about this before, anyway. He uh, 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 that was kind of an unseemly thing. And I mean, good on him for battling through an injury, I guess. But uh, bringing it out in public at that time was not really well thought out, in uh, in my opinion. Uh, he did keep bringing in the playoffs, but the problem was either he got a new injury and they're talking about something wrong with his hip now, or the sports hernia got worse and worse because by game two of the finals, I think that was his last game, he had nothing. Yeah, the, I, I mentioned this right at the time. It was the first game in over 200 as an Oiler where he had zero shots and zero hits. It's just not his game to do nothing like that. But he had nothing to give. And it's then they sat him and he true. never came back. Yeah. Um, might have so the timing was seven. really rotten. And yeah. anyway, it's... Uh, I mean, Dreisaitl was also a shadow of himself yes, in the files. And I'm 100%. not hearing people with the same kind of narrative. But I understand oh, that... True. I understand that... Um, Kane has a history. So a lot of people are reading into everything that happened, including the fight with Corey Perry on the bench late in the year, and they think, oh, he's not getting along with his teammates. And I, I just I just say I have no opinion on that. I have no idea about that. And um, I just go on the way he played on the ice, and I loved his play until he got hurt. Until he could no longer go, he, was, he went as hard as he could. And man, in those two early series against Los Angeles and Vancouver, he went hard. And he was a huge part of the Oilers' uh, success. So I'm hoping that I personally hope that he's coming back. I think he's worth his money still, and um, because it's it's you lose that player. Well, Jeff you spent a long time working do for what him. Evander Kane does. No, he is not, and neither is Arvidsson. Is is right. as much as the late Victor Arvidsson. He he will hit, hustle, and hit. But who's going to hustle and hit in this for like? So they got Kane and Holloway. They're the two big forwards. You got to have both of those guys on this roster. Otherwise, you don't have a lot of players who are physical in your mm -hmm. forward lineup anymore. And they're going to have to, I think, trade for someone. Um, like they have Corey Perry now. I, I, I mean, I'm not buying Corey Perry um, being an effective player in the playoffs next year. They're going to br have to bring in a wing, another winger, which they can do at the trade deadline, who can really come and hit people um, and play a physical, tough physical game in the playoffs. I think that's going to be a need by the time the playoffs, uh, by the trading deadline comes along. Now put yourself in Kane's shoes, though, and you're now looking at a team that went out and signed Skinner and Arvidsson to play on the second line. Where the hell do you fit? Oh, they'll oh. figure it out. There's, you know, players are up and down the roster all season long is what I notice. And they change the lines every second game or third game, and you're here, you're there, you're everywhere. He's not going to put on the top power play again this year but he, he wasn't going to anyway so um he'll he'll Either get Skinner or Arvidsson. yeah <laughs> he'll they'll figure listen if they can play their four lines Second in a PP in a, in a balanced way Bruce four lines in a bit more balanced way and not burn anybody out mm -hmm. that that's not a bad idea too and that's what they have the opportunity to do here so I'm I'm all for that 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 would be uh that would work for me um 
All right. One okay. small thing I'd like to see is the first power play unit cut back a little bit. To say yeah. minute 15. Yeah. Uh, who else was talking about that? I heard someone mentioning that. I can't remember who. It might have been um, on Got Your Back. I think um, yeah. maybe Strudwick was talking about it. And yeah, that struck me as a good idea. So we'll see. It doesn't, you know, it looks like they probably solved most of their cap trouble here. We don't know yet for sure. Maybe they still have to make another move. But, um, you know, if they go with a smaller roster this year, Bruce, um, again, like they did last year, then they're, that that helps solve that problem right there. And they're very close to meeting the cap at this point because uh, Jackson went over. Bruce, what would you say? We'll, we'll get to this in a second, actually. We'll finish up with the, the Jeff Jackson question. The next thing um, that happened was the Ryan McLeod trade. What do you think of it? Well, I'm a fan of McLeod, and I'm a fan of some of the stuff that he brings that the team doesn't have in abundance, which one of them is youth up front. Uh, another is speed uh, up front, which, you know, I always talk, you know, in terms of what he adds to team speed, but obviously his individual speed was, I mean, only McDavid really rivaled him, and I think they'll miss that. Uh, I thought he was decent value for the $2.1 million. Like he was a three, outscoring 3C, which is a nice thing to have uh, until the playoffs. Uh, but his performance in the playoffs left me a little bit cold. Uh, what I I thought they might move him out for uh, um, to make cap space, and I thought either they might trade him out with another expensive player. Like there was some people saying that he might go with, say, CC as a as a package uh, deal to. Uh, to, to um, make cap room. Uh, but I'm pretty happy with the way it turned out because they traded him and Ty Tulio, a sort of mid-level prospect in the uh, farm system, for one hell of a good prospect in uh, Matthew Savoy, younger brother of the guy the orders just cut uh, on uh, June 30th when they didn't offer him a, a, a qualifying offer. And yet here, here we are, what, five days later, trading for the younger and way more talented brother. I mean, to put this in perspective, uh, Carter Savoy went 100th overall in his draft year and Matt went ninth in his draft year. It's almost it's like comparing, you know, Seth Jones to Caleb Jones, right? They're brothers, but one of them's just got way more talent and pedigree than the other. And we got the good one now in the Savoy family. And he's uh, he's 20. He's got three. His contract that he signed two years ago after going ninth overall slid twice. So he's still got a full three years to run on his entry-level contract. He will be exempt from waivers throughout that time. So where they were going to have a numbers crunch in the fall, and lose potentially a, a player on waivers while well, they just traded a player and replaced him with a guy that they know is, you know, likely almost certain to be on the farm for the first of those years. But they have the flex that they can move him up and down when they need to. If you know, if you if you have a, a numbers crunch on the salary cap front, uh, and that's something we saw in the past. You know, with Broberg, with Holloway, that they. You know, when the, when the cap got tight, they sent them down, and because they didn't have to clear waivers, no problem. Well, next year, both those guys will have to clear waivers, so it's kind of important to have have some guys that are a little more maneuverable. And Savoy, like, at the draft, uh, when the orders traded a 2025 pick for a 2024 pick and picked uh, Sam O'Reilly, and they interviewed Jeff Jackson at that time, and he said, we got to get our pipeline going. Because they two years where they had almost no draft picks, of, you know, in the top 150. And now in a week, I would suggest that maybe the top two prospects in the order system are Matthew Savoy and Sam O'Reilly. Just got them fresh. And they had, <clears throat> you know, with really... Uh, no draft assets, <clears throat> no obvious way to bring in a, a youngster of, uh, of Savoy's 
skill. I mean, this is a guy who uh, he didn't quite get exceptional status in the WHL, but he kind of got a half a deal with uh, with Winnipeg uh, when uh, when the ice went to went to Winnipeg, and they drafted him first overall in the WHL draft, and <clears throat> they applied for exceptional status, and, they, and the league agreed that he could play half the games. So it was kind of a meet in the middle solution. That was the COVID year, but he wound up playing as a 15 year old, 20 some games in the in the dub. And usually you don't see many 15 year olds in that league. And by this past year, he had, uh, you know, he only played. He had he he played a game with Buffalo. He played six games on uh, conditioning with uh, Rochester Americans. Five points, pretty good. And then in the dub, he started Wenatchee Wild, which was where Winnipeg wound up. Mm-hmm. And then partway through the year, they traded him to Moose Jaw. And so between the two teams, 34 games, 30 goals, 71 points. And then in the playoffs, uh, not quite the rate of scoring, 19 games, though, 10 goals, 24 points, and win the league the Western Hockey League. So that's how he left junior hockey in his last year, was going to the Memorial Cup where he scored four points in four games. And so this is a guy with, you know, he's got pedigree, and it goes way back, David. I saw this guy play six and a half years ago. He's 20 now. He turned 14 on January 1st of 2018, and later that month, he was the MVP of the John Reed Memorial Tournament here in St. Albert, which is uh, one of the you know, it's very top-level Bantam tournaments. It's just tons and tons of WHL and junior scouts that attend this tournament because that is their pool that they draft from the Bantam level, right? And, I mean, the tournament that he was at here, uh, he... Uh, I saw that team play the uh, Northern Alberta uh, prep team or whatever they were called. Uh, saw him play two games, including the gold medal final. And Matt Savoy, I think he was the youngest player on the team or very close to it. He certainly was the smallest player on the team. He was tiny at that time. He looked like Theo Fleury in the scheme of things, but smaller, like everyone. You know, there was no Bobby hulking monster. Yeah, yeah, like like super tiny guy, but super skilled he scored the tying and winning goals in the third period of the gold medal game i mean that'll catch your eye so i i learned his name from the pa guy saying goal scored by number seven matthew savoy oh (laughs) i heard that name two three times already in this game and you know and just just the style of play like he really stood out for his for his smarts and competitive edge and stuff. And he's just a real tiny guy and that grabbed your attention too. And he's still small, but he's not, he's like 5'10", 180, kind of Connor Bedard size. So, you know, you'd want him hopefully to fill out a little bit, but uh, but just super skilled. And uh, uh, he was, uh, that was my first time attending the John Reed. I've been a number of years since, and uh, that was probably the most memorable in terms of prospect. He had as a teammate Dylan Gunther, Gunther, who was nine months older than him, but uh, Gunther was second in the tournament in scoring behind Savoy. Uh, there was another guy in there, uh, the young fellow that uh, Minnesota's got, or sorry, that um, Dallas has got. Uh, Stankoven? Stankoven? Yeah, yeah, Stankoven. And he was like sixth in the scoring race and, and Savoy, so... I mean, obviously, these players have changed, they've grown, they've developed, you know, physically and as hockey players since then. But at that time, he was the standout player in the tournament, and the rest of them all had 2003 birthdays. And when, it, you know, we were in the draft class a whole year earlier than his, he went ninth overall a um, couple of years after that. And now here he is in the you know, well, several years after that, now I think of it, because he was 14 and zero months at that time. And, you know, he, so he's a quite an exciting prospect. I would say he immediately becomes Edmonton's number one prospect. That's what, Bob, 
Bob Stoffer, the Oilers mentioned that number one prospect, probably yeah. true. So Bruce, I liked four things about the trade. First of all, Adam Henrique had beaten out Ryan McLeod as the fourth, third line center on the team. Right. And I think they're going to go with that next year quite right. a bit. Dylan Holloway can also play center. He's a center in college. He's a, he's he's probably at least I think he'll be as good a center as Ryan McLeod will be in their NHL careers, depending on injuries. Holloway's a slightly more aggressive. He's a much more aggressive well, player, more I should aggressive. say. And he's, he's bigger and stronger. I don't know if he's taller, but he's bigger and stronger and far more aggressive, just as skilled yeah. and a great skater too. So they, they have players to replace him. And Henrik beat him out plain and simple. And when they signed Henrik, McLeod mm-hmm. stays were number in Edmonton. Um, the cap space issue is big. He was earning $2.1 million a year. Probably going to play on the fourth line. I liked him as a second line winger, a third line winger, McLeod. I think he actually played uh, better as a winger than as a center. He uh, His speed on the attack was noticeable. He, he meshed well with Dreisaitl, but he got beat out. And the cap space, you can't have a, a fourth line player earning $2.1 million, just like DeHarnay had to go because you can't have a third pairing defenseman earning $2 million on a team with right. as many great players as the Oilers. Like Bugstad and Costin last year. Yeah. The cap for one hit million, for... they're a good deal. For two million, there just isn't space anymore. Yeah. The cap hit for Savoy is, um, well, he, he earns about, his base salary is eight eight six right. thousand, uh, a million dollars in bonus. But he's got a million dollars in bonus a year, so it's $1.9 million a year, essentially, um, his AAV. But he, whether on the Oilers, if he was to play, he'd be unlikely to make his bonuses because he's unlikely to be in the top six, although it's possible if there are injuries, they now have someone who certainly has the pedigree and the background and, and uh, you know, Scott Wheeler of the Athletics, super high on this player. Scott Wheeler yeah. ranks him 20th of the players outside the NHL. Button didn't have him on his list, top 50 list, but Wheeler did. And um, he just raves about his offensive smarts, passing ability. He just sounds like a dynamo on the attack. And so this is the the fourth thing I like. It's just his potential as a player. He's he's you, players taken at his range in the draft around nine ten, they make they become um, top end player like top six wingers or top four D men about half the time in the NHL. Mm-hmm. Half of them make it to that high level, and then half of them don't pan out at all. Looks like the Oilers are in their in the more recent drafts with Bouchard. He's already made it. Broberg has a real chance to be a top four defenseman starting next season. And Holloway, who was taken, I think, thir- 13th or 14th overall, 14th. Um, will also has a chance to be in the top six at some point in his NHL career. So Savoy, I'd say, um, based on his trajectory, it, it's a little, I, I think he's probably dropped, his 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 luster has dropped a little bit since the, since he was drafted. Um, mm-hmm. He's been injured since then, He's ha- but he had a really good season this year on the attack. But he hasn't made the NHL yet. Um, sometimes right. these guys do make it. So I, I would say he's probably got about a two and five chance at this point, just on the odds on average, this kind of play would make two, two times out of five. He would, he will be a top six NHL winger. Those are really good odds. Actually, like that kind of player is extremely rare, extremely hard to get. And, um, he's got that potential mm-hmm. and we'll see if he's able to, to cash in on it. So I see him starting the year in Bakersfield. Mm-hmm. And but if there's an injury to a top six winger or even a third line winger, we might be seeing this guy mm-hmm. in Edmonton and uh, he may impress us. We'll see what he's got. Carter Savoy was an interesting. I really like Carter Savoy's game. Super smart player. Good with the puck, but he just didn't. It didn't translate to the pro game as, you know, this happens to all kinds of top scoring players from junior and college hockey, which Carter Savoy was. Um, and it could happen to Matthew Savoy that his game will not translate either. I think Carter Savoy's game translates to Switzerland very nice. And I wouldn't expect, I would expect to see him in, in a league like Sweden and Switzerland and doing very well there. But it's, it's just, there's only so many guys who can play in the top six in the NHL. It is a rare breed. He could be one. And the, the fact that you got that kind of player who's a decent, you know, the coin flip, roughly a coin flip chance of that in a trade for Ryan McLeod. On a contract in the next three years when the owners are cash strapped, which probably isn't going to cost you a lot, right. $1.9 million at the most, 
if he if he hits all his bonuses, if he makes the and top the bonus six, part gets put off by a year. Right? Yeah. So th- yeah. his cap hit for the if he gets called up this year, we know it's going to be eight hundred and eighty six thousand. Well, yeah. we can afford that. So I, I just I just think this is a it's actually kind of a freebie trade because you had to move out salary. You had no choice. You had to move out salary. Return. And um, now you get a freebie chance at a, at a winger who's a coin flip of playing in your top six. That's kind of sweet. Like that's a, that's very nice. That's a nice piece of work from Jeff Jackson. I can see why people are related. And this is saying, this is all things considered with Ryan McLeod. He could be Ryan McLeod could play 10 more years in the NHL and be a, and it'd be a good third or even maybe second line, second line winger, third line center. Wouldn't mm-hmm. be surprised if that's his career in the NHL. He's a good player. Yeah. Oh yeah, he's got years to play. But established NHL. You can't, couldn't afford him. Yeah. And it's harder to. You can't like people were thinking. Well, we'll put Kane on the ELC. It's not going to happen. He's not, or the um, long-term LTIR, right. I should say. We're going to put right. Kane on not ELC. LTIR, long-term injured reserve. He mm-hmm. almost was healthy enough to play in Game Seven. He's not so injured that he can't play next season. So I think this is a fantasy people have. He also has a no movement clause until next February 28th. The owners can't trade him unless he says yes. So this, some people want to see him traded. Some people want to see him on LTIR. Both things, I believe, are extremely, extremely unlikely to happen. And and again, I, I'm in the camp that argues, why would you want that to happen? Because right. unless you're, who's going to be, Who's going to stand up in the playoffs to Vincent DeHarnay? The hammer. Yeah, when Vincent DeHarnay's hammering on Leon Draisaitl, who's going to go get him? <laughs> it's it's not going to be Jeff Skinner, you know. Yeah. So we'll see, we'll see. I like Jeff Skinner again, and I like all, all these players, but you need mm-hmm. someone in the it, who can do this in the playoffs. Look at Florida, like with Sam Bennett, like the menace of that guy and the, what he contributed to that team. So. Um, Bruce, let's end this off with a just a grading of Jackson, Jeff Jackson. I want to add one thing first on, on Matt Savoy. He is, in fact, a center and a right shot center. He could wind up being on the wing, as we've seen with so many of these other guys, you know, Ryan McLeod yeah. included, Ryan Nugent Hopkins included, Adam Henrique, Leon Drysaddle. That can switch over to the wing, uh, but... He comes at it from you know center ice position and a right shot center at that. So cool. I, that, that, uh, yeah, that checks a couple of couple of boxes. And if he winds up being a winger, fine. And the comp that I heard from him that caught my ear was Braden Point. That's a big comp. We'll <laughs> see. Compliment. We'll see. That's a big. Com- <laughs> it's a compliment. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah. We'll see about that but he has things in common with that guy just a who was you know a small guy with a big motor who just kept scoring at the whl level and just kept on going and kept on scoring well yeah. that's the high bar which in points case point is came out of nowhere foot 10 right yeah 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 he was like a third round pick yeah it but it's, so it's steal. always much more highly rated from a younger age but apparently he's got an incredible work ethic that's what Scott Weider really likes about it. Just his compete level is 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 really strong. So that little kid cool. at the John Reacher showed that. <laughs> there you go. That was there you impressive. Go. <clears throat> Jacko, mm-hmm. how do you rate him, Bruce? On a scale of uh, the cult of hockey, the cult of hockey scale of uh, uh, one to ten, what what do you think of Jeff Jackson's work as interim GM since he took over from Ken Holland? It's the draft because he was there. Uh, i given him a hard nine. Nine out of ten. He's done a fantastic job. He's, uh, uh, he said we need to get the, the uh, pipeline going, and he stocked it with two, two really good prospects that kind of came out of nowhere. You know, it looked like, well, we've got no picks, and we, you know, we've got no real way of getting them. Well, now they've got... Uh, um, O'Reilly and uh, uh, younger Savoy in in the system, uh, but what he's done on the on the big league uh, club uh, with the signings, he took the hard decision on Jack Campbell, but it had to be done. Of all of the uh, signings that he's done so far, and the, the transactions, 
the only 10 figure contract that's been involved in any of this of them is the one they divested in Jack Campbell's. Uh, otherwise, everything, the biggest one was 8 million, uh, 6 million, 4.5 million. You know, it's total dollars over multiple years in each of these cases. And uh, really uh, added some, uh, some good stuff. I, I like the innovation that I'm seeing from this guy. And uh, he's uh, he's really got the uh, uh, I think his experience as an agent is really coming about like he knows the GMs because he's been negotiating with these guys for years as an agent. And uh, it was. Uh, 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 I, I saw some people were grading him on free agent day. Uh, there were, you know, a B somebody did a similar question uh -huh. and i saw some responses said well I'll, I'll give him a b or b minus if he traded cc i'd give him an a well free agent day wasn't about making trades it was about adding guys and I, he added guys and brought guys back and brought back that entire third line for for five and a half million bucks brought in those two top six wingers for seven million bucks and and added a bunch of depth guys and none of them none of the depth guys was more than about one million i think perry was about the about the biggest one and he was i think 1.4 million with bonuses which he may or may not make and a contract that's fully variable it's to me it's a challenge to cory perry that's the amount was no accident 1.15 million dollars which is the exact dollar figure that can be buried in the ahl and to me that's a challenge cory you know Here's your chance. We're giving you the maximum money that we can, but if you don't make the team, we can send you down. And you know, it's it's not going to be any dead cap. You can't afford any more dead cap. You got to you know make the team and earn that money, but you're going to have the chance to do it. And seeing in that light, um, I, the Perry contract was one I, I didn't think they would go back to him, but I, it's actually a pretty low risk in that yeah. they can do exactly that yeah. if he's you know if he's comes back and he doesn't have it well it's no risk right yeah. you can just enter the minors there's no cap yet so pretty pretty solid like safe smallish bets on good hockey players yeah. and and he's flushed out the roster with you know fairly marginal cap space to do it with and they still got an issue to solve on defense uh, they still have to take care of business and get Holloway and Broberg under contract. And dry saddle. And some full, yeah, well, yeah, I'm just thinking even of those entry level guys first yeah. that are, they yeah. don't have a contract as of now. Dry saddle and Bouchard still have a yeah. year. So in due course, it'll be them. It'd be nice to get those ELC, you know, those qualified guys actually signed so they're not at risk of an offer sheet not that it's probably going to happen but i'd rather just have it done and then see what, again what the lay of the land is on contract like if they sign them for one year or two or three years it gives you very different scenarios in terms of the, what their cap hits up uh, up to be so he still has work to do but he's done a hell of a lot in under a week like it's pretty amazing when you when you look at the you know the full week's worth of, of work from uh, Calvin Pickard last Friday to uh, Ma Matthew Savoy this Thursday and all of the you know the draft picks all of the signings and you know decisions and uh, you know judgments rendered in the case of uh, Jack Campbell uh, Ryan McLeod and the free agents that were allowed to walk, you know, uh, Carter Savoy even, you know, like it didn't work out for everyone to stay, but uh, I think he's kept the guts of his team. And I think he's added some pretty meaningful parts around the edges. And he's done, I think, spectacularly well to add those two high level prospects to a system that desperately needed an injection of talent. Well, I just got one, I got two. And that's uh, that's good work by him. And, and 
you know, for a guy who claims he doesn't want to be GM, he's done one heck of a job in his first bash of it. Here's what um, Captain Jack says. He's an Oilers fan on Twitter, at Oilers Jack. Mm-hmm. He says, starting to look like Jeff Jackson's worst move as GM is going to be when he hires a GM. <laughs> and then uh, there's a uh, Oilers blogger, Matt Henderson, who has got a fairly sharp tongue. And he, he said, I guess when you hire a former agent to run your hockey, hockey club, they have a pretty good idea who the stupidest GMs are. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, that was right after tonight's ouch. trade. Ouch! Ouch! Uh-huh. And, I, and I thought that's rather unkind, but it just made me laugh so hard. I thought I gotta, I gotta, I, I love that. And you know what? Um, there may be some truth to it. I don't know. I can't say. But I will say this: I, there seems to be, a, and you, a little difference between the deals that Ken Holland would sign in the deals Jackson would sign. And I don't know if it's because the Oilers, after making the cup final, are in a far more advantageous position. Mm-hmm. And as it becomes starting to become clear, rumor out of Germany today that, or some comment, translated comment out of Germany, that Dreisaitl's agent's talking about Leon signing. Of course, Leon saying he loves to be an Oiler. Maybe it's because the the idea that McDavid and Dreisaitl are going to be here a long time is really taking, firming up. But it seems like... Um, Jackson gets a lot better deals than Holland ever got. And um, that may just be because, again, the state of the team has changed and it's that much easier to convince people to be here. Word is also getting around that Daryl Cates apparently is one hell of an owner in terms of meeting the needs of the players, in terms of uh, facilities, giving them what they need, in terms of training, uh, diet, exercise, airplane rides, concert tickets, who knows what else. Um, you know, like it just seems like this is an owner's owner who, this is an owner who is really hitting a sweet spot in terms of pleasing NHL players and knowing what, understanding what they want, kind of the first class lifestyle that they've all grown accustomed to and, and providing it. So maybe it's easier for Jackson. Mm-hmm. But I do have a sense, Bruce, that he is a, is a remarkably persuasive person. Yes. And I think part of it is that I think he is able because he was a player agent and he's been in management because he was an agent. I think he's done a lot of thinking about what players want and what GMs want and what all sides in agreement want. And I think he's doing I think I'm just and this is just guessing that he does a really good job of understanding his opponent, what his opponent needs to hear, what his opponent needs, period. And and. Mm-hmm. And selling them that, provi- framing the deal around give, giving the other guy what he really needs mm-hmm. and then getting what he needs in return, Jackson needs in return. Hey, and I Jeff that's- Skinner, we, you've already made them all the money you could possibly need in your life, $100 million. But you don't want to go down in history as the guy that played never played in the playoff game. You want to play in a playoff game with a team that has a real crack at it. And boy, could we ever use a scoring winger on Leon Dreisaitl's line. How would you like to have him as your center? Now, we can only give you three million bucks, but just for one year, you know, and then in a year's time, your bargaining position will be fantastic and we'll see where it goes, you know. I don't don't think he frames it like that, Bruce. I think he gave us a hint with Dreisaitl, (laughs) with the Dreisaitl contract. And he said something interesting. And I think this is how he frames things. He said, I got to talk to, we got to get the new GM and we have to talk hockey philosophy. We've got to talk some philosophy. So I don't think it's like, I think it's very subtle. I'm guessing. And it's more like our whole goal here is excellence. You know, we have excellence in every facet of this operation, you know, from the team facility to, you know, the training, what the players eat to how they exercise. Every single thing is at the very highest level. And um, for like, this is a free agent pitch. We think you could fit into that, into that world, right. into the, into that culture of excellence, that you could be part of that. And, yeah. you know, it, it's not without its sacrifices, but the rewards are tremendous. And I think just what he was saying, like this philo- this philosophy 
that he, because what, listen, the philosophy that they need to sell the Leon Dreisaitl and Connor McDavid is if you take 14% or 15 or 16% of the cap, it's not going to work for winning the Stanley Cup. But I don't think you could, like, you don't say that because you, what you, you know, you just sell them on the, on the dream and the, on the, the things that make them hum as hockey players, which is to, to win championships, to be an excellent player, to be part of a great team, to be part of a higher purpose. And I think that's what he is. He's kind of a higher purpose guy. And he's selling that. And it's, I think it's working. And again, just speculating. I don't know what he's saying, but it's a very, it's a very, he, I, he tipped his hand a little bit there when he talked about his slow play on the dry cell contract and the need to talk philosophy because you're only talking philosophy when you want to, when, when you want to do a very clever sell job on him taking 12%. Of the cap. <laughs> that's my, well, the first my, selling my, point is, Hey, look, Leon, what we were able to do with the extra money we had while you're still making 8.5, we got you two wingers that you needed and wanted, you know, potentially it sure helps, anyway, doesn't it? Like when these other, when these players take all discounts, mm-hmm. that's the culture. Now yeah. it helps the most though, when the big guys take it and, and, and um, to win the Stanley Cup and compete in the years to come for the Cup, the way the NHL structured, everybody's got to do that or it yeah. won't happen. And uh, we'll see what happens in these next negotiations. I noticed that Frank Saravalli was actually talking about $14 million for dry settle initially. And then the last time I heard Frank talk, he was thinking, oh, I think it might be a little less than that. Because 14% is actually a fairly high percentage of the cap. I think it's around... 14 million, yeah, it'll be 15 percent of, of 88 million. Yeah, it's a fairly high percentage of the cap, so they actually need Leon to come in like more around 13, 12 to 13. Um, and and I don't know, and again, I don't hold it against the player if that doesn't work for them and they they mm-hmm. need the money, and if that's what the orders if the orders decide to pay, they decide to pay. I don't hold it against Darnell Nurse what he makes, he negotiated that contract and it was done in good faith by both mm-hmm. sides. Um, you know, I hold against the players their performance, whatever they make, and I hold it in favor when they, when they're playing well. But uh, you know, if they, if if it goes a different direction, but I think Jackson is brilliant at selling a vision and uh, and an idea, and it's working. What grade did you give him? I'm with you. I, I would have given him a ten. I, cross is it a ten? I was thinking. And then I thought, well, if he had been able to trade Jack Campbell's contract, um, and uh, not and not swallow too much of a poison pill, or if he had been able to move out CC and get something, um, although he did move out McLeod and get something, but if he had been able to move Jack Campbell's contract at a and not have to buy him out, and if that had worked out, right. I would have said ten. But um, and so that's walking on water as GM making a move like that, and it can be done now and then. But so I would give, I'm with you, nine, a hard nine, and it's close to 9.5 for me. Outstanding like, that's, is what nine means. And I'd that's say right. that's what his last week really has was. been. And a word, outstanding. So. Yeah. All right. Are we done? Any final thoughts or go Team Canada and, and soccer, man? Beat go those Team Arctic Canada teams. and soccer. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, the orders are in a. Uh, pretty solid position right now today compared to where they were, you know, as the season came to an end and uh, all of these, you know, expiring contracts, the low money contracts were expiring, the big money contracts were hanging around forever and there was a lot of ways things could have gone sideways and not too many ways where they actually did go sideways. So I think it's, uh, it's been a very encouraging uh, week of uh, of uh, management by team with no manager. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he'll always be the manager. I think like yeah. he'll do a lot of the work. He, I, I, you know, the way he described GM is you travel with the team and you're taking care of a lot of the day to day stuff right. on the road. He doesn't want to do that. Right. Oh, and the final thing, um, John Shan was on uh, orders now tonight and. There's there has been talk that um, um, Stan Bowman might might be the Oilers GM, and a lot of people kind of leapt on that. And John Shannon, uh, he played downplayed that notion quite a bit tonight on Oilers. Now, 
saying that he thinks that Stan Bowman will probably come back to the NHL in an advisory capacity initially, fairly quiet role, not right. running the show. And I think that's probably what's going to happen as well. And I think that's uh, probably a, an appropriate path. Um, and I, I, so I don't know. He, John Shannon said he had not asked Jackson, but that's his understanding is what's going to happen with. Uh, yeah, with just Bowman. making the guy a full fledged GM after he's been away from the game for two and a half years. It's well, there's that too, right? Yeah. A bit of a bit of a reach, but yeah, we'll see what happens. But that's. You know, what I think there'll be an outcry no matter what. Yeah. Uh, what the job description is if he gets hired just based on the history. But anyway, Josh Shannon had, I thought, I heard that section as well. I thought he had a, a good point about that. Yeah. All right, Bruce, let's leave it there. All right. Thanks for talking tonight. Yeah, thanks for listening, everyone. And in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast. <laughs>